thank you so much for having me and for talking about uh, the genocide in Gaza. I, you know, it, it, when I start talking about it, I get cheered up because there's journalists that I knew of that I was communicating with that are gone, that are killed by the Israel forces. Um, starting way back with Shireen, Shireen was supposed to be on my show and she was killed a couple weeks before her appearance. And I knew her mentor. So this is, you know, it didn't start October 7th. It started way back um, and started back to 1948, actually. So could you start out by just telling um, our family that watches, our audience that, that participates in this, who you are and how you came to find, to found the, um, the news outlet that you did and, and, you know, go from there. Sure. Um, so I am the founder and director of Mint Press News. We are an independent watchdog journalism outlet that covers the permanent war state and the profiteers of the permanent war state. And while we are just about uh, 12 years old at Mint Press, I would say uh, Mint Press was born when I was 13 years old after I had lived under Israeli occupation and apartheid for three and a half, almost four years as a preteen and into my teenage uh, years. And so having witnessed the brutality of the apartheid uh, regime, uh, seeing bombs being dropped on civilian homes, having our water cut off, having lived um, under military curfews, and just being a child that went to school um, every day during the second intifada when it had broken out, uh, only to see you know, many of my classmates not come to school because they were being blocked at checkpoints. It was really devastating and a lot to process. And so when we had moved back to the, to the United States where I was, I'm actually born, I'm born and raised in, in America, but I just lived in Palestine for those short three and a half, four years, because that's where my family is originally from. They're Palestinian from Jerusalem, from the holy, from the old city. And um, when we had moved back, it was my first time being exposed to war propaganda. It was a few months before September 11th. And as a 13 year old kid, I had turned to the media to keep up to date with what was going back, what was going on back home in Palestine, only to find the media flipping the narrative, presenting it as uh, a religious war, people fighting each other for thousands of years, Muslim versus Jew, never through the lens of occupation, never through the lens of apartheid, never through the lens of ethnic cleansing, genocide, um, and the fact that the United States uh, uses Israel as a military proxy for itself in the Middle East. And then after September 11th, you know, a couple of months later, September 11th came, um, I was once again turning to the media to make sense of the world around me, and I witnessed how the media beats the drum of beats the drums of war, how it manufactures consent for war by public by framing news stories in a certain way that dehumanizes the victims of our war, and so. That's really where Mint Press was born. And at 13 years old, having seen the way the media painted Palestinians and the way that media uh, justified its two wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, I knew at that age as a teenager, while other kids were, you know, having, you know, uh, partying and having their first teenage experiences, my heart and mind were in the media. And I saw that there was a, a void in independent voices and journalists and people like myself who had lived under war um, to provide an alternative um, to the media propaganda machine that was continuously beating the drums of war. And this is of course, living in a post 9-11 era um, where we were ruled by George Bush and his handlers in the White House who launched those disastrous wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And so I took the pain and that PTSD that I had um, suffered from, from living under occupation and the Islamophobia that we were seeing in after September 11th, and knew that it was journalism that I wanted to pursue. And so that's where really Mint Press was born. Now, sorry, long answer, but that's where it all started. Oh, I, I mean, that that's a really substantive answer. And you're also award-winning journalist as well. You've won um, two major awards um, that I know of. Um, and, and in fact, um, a smaller award came from um, INN, from Indie News Network uh, last year. Oh, yes. <laughs> 
can't figure out what, but, um, and they, uh, they're so wonderful. They volunteer actually, um, unpaid and help me get my podcast out because oh. I'm shadow banned, um, and suppressed as you know. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so what you're telling me is really moving in the sense that you're talking about coming of age in journalism and, and, but as well as coming in of age in an apartheid state. And in a very formative age, I might add. So how did that inform you now? And when you look back at it with, and I don't know if you have children or not, or maybe you're an auntie, but like, how does that inform how you're looking at other kids coming up now? And when you're seeing history repeat itself, but even worse, you know, with what's happening right now with the- It actually feels like we're living in a post right after 9-11 all over again with the way that the media- is manufacturing consent for Israel's bombardment of a civilian population. Um, you know, at 13 years old, I was first exposed to propaganda. And I was also first exposed to what life was like living under bombs, living under a military occupation. It's an unfortunate reality that no child um, should have to live through, but that became the lens in which I began to see the world from. And when I looked around me at the, the kids and, and um, the mass public in the United States, I saw them as asleep because they were consuming a media, a corporate mainstream media that was only owned by six corporations. And they control what over 90% of what Americans see, hear, and read. And I think that number is even smaller now <laughs> for how many corporations own our media. And now we're actually even consuming news at the behest of big tech giants that also um, work directly with NATO funded think tanks like the Atlantic Council and weapons manufacturers like Lockheed Martin and Boeing and General Dynamics. And they also work directly with the state of Israel. And the reason why I say it feels like we're living in the same kind of era, because shortly after September 11th, one of the most famous videos that uh, CNN and MSNBC played where uh, was a video of Palestinians celebrating Eid, a religious holiday after Ramadan. And they were handing out candy and they were celebrating Eid, but CNN planted that video after September 11th and said that Palestinians were celebrating 9-11. They were celebrating the terrorist attacks against America. And so that's the kind of propaganda we are seeing today. The entire basis of the October 7th Hamas attack on Israel that we've come to know. The entire basis and narrative of what happened that day has has many, much of it has been proven to be false. And it's not even being talked about within the mainstream corporate media. CNN has retracted the 40 beheaded babies. So has the Biden White House, but it's too late because they had already pushed that story out. When CNN and MSNBC planted that story of Palestinians celebrating Eid in Gaza, they also retracted that story about a month later after pressure and people exposed that that, that story was not Palestinians celebrating 9-11, that was in fact Palestinians celebrating Eid. And so the media is continuously pushing these fake stories. And in fact, what we know about uh, October 7th that is coming out from within the Israeli military itself is that the majority of those killed were actually soldiers. And that civilians were actually Israeli civilians were being targeted and killed by their own. Yes. And so even though we know these things have come out, this new information, which completely has reshaped the narrative about what has happened on October 7th, the media is still pushing many outlets, including Politico. Every week I see a story on their website leading with the 40 beheaded stories as if it's real. Yeah, the 40 babies. It never happened. <laughs> but now you have babies that actually died, preemies that have actually died, um, 39. Exactly. So okay. today we have images of actual Palestinian premature babies, um, about 40 of them that were connected to incubators. They were let in the incubators to breathe. They're premature babies, and they have had to be unplugged because the Al Shifa hospital has run out of fuel. They've run and they're running off of generators now for electricity. And of course, the media is not really showing this, this image, this really 
just heart-wrenching image of these babies because Palestinian lives don't matter. And I think that's one of the biggest things is that we've learned from this uh, media propaganda campaign by Western corporate media, which by the way, I don't even call them establishment media anymore. They're an extremist media beating the drums of war. And the way they do this is through soft propaganda of dehumanization of the victims of our war. And so you'll see outlets framing every single news story with one simple line of Hamas, Hamas, Hamas. Israel believes Hamas has built tunnels here. Israel says that Hamas is using these hospitals um, as a human shield or the people inside the hospital as human shields. Hamas is using um, these ambulances to ship weapons. When we have, <laughs> it's like, you know, the Palestinian people cannot be, they cannot be given the same kind of um, humanity as Israeli civilians. Um, we are constantly being dehumanized and the word Hamas has been used as like this really bad word within, you know, Western corporate media. And it's because of what we don't really know of what's happening on the ground. Well, it, you know, they've labeled it as ter a terrorist organization. And I had a conversation um, two weeks ago with someone and I said, look, you know, I'm, I mean, uh, my family came from uh, Ireland and uh, emigrated to the U.S., uh, much of them. And uh People can call the IRA terrorists. They're not terrorists. The, the occupying force, the British army, labeled the IRA terrorists. They're actually a resistance force, in my mind. But I'm, you know, that's my background. And and in the case of Hamas, if you look at the real origins of Hamas, it's a resistance organization, and it has other, you know. So there's an argument there, and the, and the argument is is the way the propaganda works um, is how to by labeling something terrorist you're dehumanizing you're making the ultimate evil enemy you're making that it, without question those people should be killed without a trial without due process it's like a it's like a, a word that you use to demonize um, a, a group or or a person um, in that case so. I really and that's what I mean. And that's what I mean. It feels like we're living in a post 9-11 word world because terrorism was used to justify the terrorism that our country launched on Iraq and Afghanistan that resulted in two million people dead in Iraq, two million dead in Afghanistan. And hospitals at that time were being were being bombed and targeted. Civilians were being bombed and targeted. Chemical weapons by the United States were ironically being used um, on civilians um, in those countries. And so right now, because this word terrorism is being pushed around, civilians in Gaza are being targeted and their deaths are just being forgotten and whitewashed. It's, it's stunning, really. Um, besides the fact, of course, the electricity, the starvation, the lack of water, bombing the water truck when there are people desperately in need, leaving people under the rubble when if they use their bulldozers instead of knocking down houses to try to save some people and some children, but instead 1500 people remain under the rubble, most likely by now dead. And it's, it's, it's stunning, you know, with Iraq, we saw it, but I think with social media now, and now, you know, I, I wanted you to speak to this about social media, how has this changed the ability for them to, to whitewash and get this propaganda out and, and make and dehumanize when we're seeing images of babies and families being wiped out and, and you know, it, it, it's happening in real time. Um, and I well, what we so, so talk a little bit about like what that means, seeing it roll out a genocide, basically roll out on Twitter and, and other social media platforms. Mm -hmm.